Well, we're continuing along in our series in Galatians. So today's scripture reading is from this next passage, verses 19 to 24. So would you follow along as I read today's scripture text? Now, the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let's come again before the Lord and ask for his help at this time. God, as we come to this portion of scripture, uh, which is a mirror to our hearts and our actions, Lord, we pray that you would cause us to be humble like the tax collector, not like the Pharisee who seeks to justify himself, but that we would humble ourselves under the piercing light of your word, that we would confess our sins freely before you and find forgiveness and that your spirit would cause us to crucify our flesh and our desires and our sinful desires Lord, that we would be led by your spirit that we would walk by your spirit help us at this time help me lord to speak your words after you in jesus name amen Well, again, church, I want to say, those of you here and those of you connecting from home, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. As we begin a new year, it is customary for people to make New Year's resolutions, right? Now that the calendar has turned, there's something about January 1 that, you know, there, that we have hope. New beginnings seem possible since um, since the calendar has turned and, and the slate has been wiped clean, apparently. But today, uh, instead of going the usual way, instead of looking forward with bright eyes to the future, I suggest that we look backwards. Of course, we could have done this before the new year, but it's, it turns out this is how our texts were scheduled, our scripture passages. Anyway, it's early enough in the new year that uh, we can still reflect on the past. And why is it important to reflect on the past? So, th so that we can have our bearings for the future. You can look back and see how far you've come or how far you haven't come so that we can know how the future looks. And I think this is an important practice. It's an important practice to reflect on your past that I think not nearly enough of us do. Uh, I think we're quick, very quick to make resolutions for the future. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Frankly, uh, those resolutions are broken quickly often, right? But how often do we stop and think about how we actually did on those resolutions? How often do we, at the end of a calendar year, think back and think, hey, how did I do on what I said I was going to do at the beginning of 2020, for example. How often do we think about the past, whether it's our successes or our failures? Now, I bring up the discipline of reflection and evaluation, not only because 2020 has ended, but because our text, again, our text invites us to evaluate ourselves. That is, 
the way to our approach today's text, you saw this extensive list of the works of the flesh. The way to approach our text today is self-evaluation. By the way, today's message is entitled, The Works of the Flesh. You also see at the bottom, verse 22 on, the fruit of the Spirit. We will not be talking about the fruit of the Spirit today. There's too much to unpack in one day here. So today we'll be focusing on the first portion of this passage. Now, let me remind you where we are in the book of Galatians. Last week's message was simply about, do you remember? Walk by the Spirit. That is, if you are united to Christ by faith, then you have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that even though sin, of course, sin still dwells in you, the desires of the flesh are still raging within you, that's no longer the real you or the permanent you. The real you is united to Christ. The real you obeys the voice of the Holy Spirit who dwells within you. So before we even begin, let me remind you again, church, walk by the Spirit. And so today's passage is a continuation of Paul's message here. And, he, and today's passage, he's basically outlining the two different ways of living. And to review, what are those two ways of living? On the one hand, you can obey, you can gratify the desires of the flesh. What does that mean? That means you just say yes to the desires of the flesh. You don't resist the sinful desires within you. Or on the other hand, you obey the desires of the Spirit. You have the Spirit that now dwells in you. Now the Spirit is also producing desires within you, holy desires, righteous desires. And instead of obeying the desires of the flesh, now you, you obey the desires of the Spirit. Instead of obeying the desires of the flesh, now you resist the desires of the flesh. These are the two ways. You can obey the, spirit, the flesh or the Spirit. You can walk by the flesh or you can walk by the Spirit. And today, our focus is on, will be on the first. That's why today, it's, our message is called the works of the flesh. And before we actually divide, uh, dive into the, the specifics, we saw this whole list here. There's 15 words, that 15 works of the flesh that Paul lays out for us. I'm going to dive into each of those. But before we do, what should we say about this list? First of all, they're called works. The, the focus here is on the deeds of those who gratify the desires of the flesh. If you gratify the desires of the flesh, if you are led by the flesh, that is your, your sinful desires within you, that means you are walking by the flesh. You walk by the flesh. So these are the works or the deeds or the actions that come out of people who obey the desires of the flesh, right? We all have these sinful desires within us. Everyone does. Everyone who is alive still has the flesh within them. These works or deeds come out of people who say yes to those desires within them. Secondly, this we see in verse 19, the introduction to this list, Paul says, now the works of the flesh are evident. They're obvious. They're undeniable. There's no mystery that these, these works of the flesh are sins. Furthermore, there is no mystery about whether or not they're in your life. That is, it doesn't require a great amount of introspection. It doesn't require, you know, serious meditation upon yourself to know if these works of the flesh are in your life. They're evident. You can see them right on the face. The emphasis here is not on our secret desires, the internal motives of our heart. Sometimes the internal motives of our heart can be very mysterious. What's going on? But these are external deeds that if they're not written on your face, you're doing them with your hands. 
These are actions that flow out of a heart that is obeying the flesh within them. But often, the, even though these works are obvious, they're, they're evident, our problem is that we are self-righteous. Our problem is that we are like the Pharisee in the temple. So we absolutely, we need the Holy Spirit to illumine our minds so that we can see the truth about ourselves. You guys know what it means to be, to be willfully blind to your own faults? That's, that's all of us. We all want to justify ourselves, even when it's so obvious to everyone else. And so we need the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the truth about ourselves. The third thing about this list is that it's not exhaustive. These are not all of the works of the flesh. It's a big list. It does cover a lot of territory here. But at the end of this list, you'll see um, in verse 21, the end, of this the end of this list says, and things like this, and things like these, basically, etc." Meaning this list is only a representative sample. They do not cover the whole gamut of fleshly works that, that flow out of our sinful desires. But these were probably the particular sins that needed to be addressed uh, for the Galatian Christians. And it's very likely that if the Apostle Paul had written a letter to Philadelphia, that is to, to our church, to the church of, not to the church of, to Chinese Gospel Church, if he wrote this letter to us, this list would look different for us. Nevertheless, even though this list isn't complete, it paints a vivid enough picture that we should be able to determine what the other things like these are. So again, this is not an exhaustive list, but it gives us an idea of what some other sins might be. Now, what's the point of this list? It's, it's quite simple. The point is that we should be brought to repentance. That is, when your sins are exposed, whether by this list or some other way, the necessary response must be repentance. It is necessary because that's how a person is a Christian in the first place. The focus of Galatians has been on faith alone as a means of salvation. But faith includes repentance. That is, if you receive Jesus by faith, that necessarily involves turning away from your sins, right? You don't, you, you, you don't receive Jesus, you know, Jesus into your heart and still make room for your sins within you. You can't worship God and idols together. You've got to choose. You've got to choose God or idols, not both. If you believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you must turn away from your sins. You cannot, again, you cannot love both Jesus and your sins. You must hate one and love the other. Pick, right? Do you hate, hate sins and love Jesus or do you hate Jesus and love sins? That's how it's gotta be. Now, of course, we still sin. We still stumble. But is there repentance? Is there a growing grief, a growing hatred of your sin? How do you know if you're walking in repentance, if you're growing in repentance, if you hate your sin more and more, if you're grieved by your sin more and more? Or are you happy, are you perfectly happy peaceful roommates with your sin, right? It's, it's there, it's not, you don't think it's bothering you too much, so there isn't a growing grief, a growing hatred of your sin. Church, let us not make peace with our sin. Let us, as we walk by the Spirit, let us make war 
with our sin. Let us repent of our sins and let us turn to our true King, Jesus Christ. Now we begin in this list, in verse 19, with three words or three works of the flesh that deal with sexual sin. These are sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. It's interesting if uh, you guys know about the King James Version. This was uh, a version that was translated, uh, I believe, in the 1600s. And in that version of the Bible, they translated the word that here is shown as sexual immorality into, into two words or into two different words separated by a comma. They translated that to adultery and fornication. As in, they wanted to communicate that sexual immorality includes both adultery. You guys know what adultery is? It's, it's, it's when... Uh, it's, it involves marriage. If you cheat on your spouse or you, or you have sex with someone who is, who is married, right? Adultery involves marriage, right? And so the, the translators of the King James versions, they wanted to make clear it's sexual immorality is both adultery as well as fornication. Fornication is, a, is an old word that refers to sex before marriage, premarital sex. And again, the, those people in the 1600s, they wanted to make clear sexual immorality includes both, not just adultery. And, and of course, it is. That is sin. Having sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend is sin. Living with your fiancé is sin. The biblical ethic for sexuality is that all sex outside of the confines of holy marriage is sin. But the Greek word that's actually translated, that, was, that used to be translated adultery and fornication, and here is translated sexual immorality, it's actually just one word, which is porneia. That's the Greek word, porneia. And that sounds familiar, right? It's, that's where we get the word pornography. But sexual immorality is a better translation because it's not just adultery and fornication. Sexual immorality covers the whole range of all sexual sins that are possible, right? Uh, you can, it's not just adultery and fornication. There's, there's a whole list of sins that are possible that are covered by this umbrella term, porneia. We live in a very sexually permissive culture. Sexually immoral behavior is encouraged. Uh, think of, now some of you have been outside, out of school for some years now, but in the public education these days, sex education, what's called sex education these days is very much, uh, you know, getting into the details of all sorts of behaviors. It's it's basically they're encouraging to teenagers to try these things out, right? That's, that's a feature of our culture these days. Or think of the prevalence of what are known as hookup apps. Um, I don't have to tell you the names of these, of these uh, apps on phones. I'm not trying to advertise these to you, to, to you people, but it's out there, right? Our society's morals are flipped upside down. So that today, nobody bats an eye if an unmarried couple lives together. Nobody says, hey, there's something wrong there. But it is actually scandalous when people find out that a Christian couple has not kissed before marriage. They're like, what? That's crazy. Right? But if, if, a, if, a, uh, if a couple lives together before marriage, well, of course, that's expected. Right? The morals are flipped upside down. That's today, but guess what? The early Christians in the times in the Roman Empire, they also lived in a sexually permissive culture. And so Gentiles, that is the non-Jewish people, they, the Gentiles especially were participants in this culture where sexual sin was not only tolerated, but it was celebrated. It's very much like that in our society today. So that 
one of the most important ways that Christians must stand out from the surrounding culture is in the area of, of our sexual habits and our behaviors. As Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Church, how are you doing in this area of your life? Now, let me pause here and speak directly to the young people in our congregation. I'm speaking direct. I'm thinking about people who are still living at home. There's a real danger here that you can deceive yourself into thinking that you are obedient in this area of sexual immorality because you haven't had sex yet, right? But this can very well be the case because you just haven't had the opportunity to sin. You're still living at home. There's a curfew. Your parents are on top of you, right? You still have to live according to their rules. But once you leave home, if you have not resolved in your heart to fight this temptation, it will be very easy to go along with the flow and, and do what everyone else is doing. It will be very easy to give in to your sin. sin sinful desires, these very strong desires, once these external protections are removed. And, all, and most, most of you, you're going to leave home. You're going to go to college. You're going to go off and work. So again, I ask you, how are you doing in this area of your life? Are you living according to the flesh? Or are you walking by the Spirit? And just in case this, this term here, porneia, doesn't cover it all, Paul adds two more words here that add a little more depth to the picture, impurity and sensuality. And these words, obviously, they speak to the sexualized and pornified culture that we live in, right? Our culture can be described as impure and sensual. Vast amounts of filth and titillation are available to us anytime we want from the secrecy of our mobile phones. I use, I use scare quotes here because we think it's secret. Nobody can, nobody can see what I'm doing on my phone, but God sees, right? We fool ourselves into thinking it's secret behavior, but it's... It's foolish to think that if you believe in God. But it's not just the, more, the immoral acts themselves that are against the will of God. It, the problem here goes even deeper. It's that our minds, our wills, and our desires, are they completely given over to lust? That's what these, that's what these two words are. Are, are, are talking about impurity and sensuality. And isn't that the, the end goal of pornography, for, ex, for, for example? Right? It's not just the sex acts that are works of the flesh, but what does, what does pornography lead to? It leads to a person who's fully given over to impure thoughts and to, sensu, and to sensuality. So again, again, how are you doing in this area? Church, I invite you to assess yourself honestly. It's only when we are in the light. Our, we usually don't like to be in the light like that. But it's only when we are in the light, when our darkness is exposed, that we can be cleansed and purified. Now, the next two, we're going to move on from that subject to the next two works of the flesh, which are called idolatry and sorcery. And these have to do with the pagan religions that the Galatians had come out of. So what is idolatry? It's simply the worship of anything apart from the one true God. And the Galatians, they quite literally worshipped idols. They worshipped uh, so-called gods before they came to Christ. And of course, these things still exist today in other religions. But idolatry is not limited to worshiping 
gods and, and literal idols, the human heart can and does worship literally anything. The, the human heart just loves to worship money, sex, power, fame, the list goes on. And so the idolatry is the sin of exalting someone or something above God. Exalting them where you serve it or their demands. So for example, if money is your idol, you will do anything to get more of it. And your greatest fear, if money is your idol, is losing your money, right? And so the meaning of life, if money is your idol, is what? The meaning of life is to get rich, is to get wealthy. That's idolatry. Sorcery, sorcery, <laughs> you think, it's, it's kind of humorous when you read it, but it's related to the pagan religions because it's, it was practiced as a way to, to, uh, to get at power, power, otherworldly power for, for your own ends. Now, now you think, oh, we live in a scientific age, right? People believe in science, so we don't need to talk about sorcery. But, but actually, it's interesting. Even though we do live in a technological, scientific age, there, there is a growing trend of people these days, today, who are getting into witchcraft and things like Wicca. I don't know if you've heard of these things, right? There are, are and the reason this is, is because the surrounding culture around us has lost its faith in God. We live in a, right? Uh, we live in a atheistic culture, and so God isn't there. Something, it has to be replaced. And so many people are turning to things like witchcraft, things like spiritual and pagan practices. And so even something so that you might consider innocent, such as fortune telling or astrology, these fall under the umbrella term of sorcery, of, of, of trying to get some sort of spiritual power apart from God. And so church, I would say to you, I'll say to you, have nothing to do with these things. The next eight works of the flesh, starting with enmity and ending with envy, can all be grouped together under the heading of community relationships. These are all sins that are harmful to community relationships. And it's quite striking that Paul devotes so much of his attention here to these type of sins. As I said before, there, were, there are 15 sins here and eight, more than 50% of them are devoted to talking about community breaking sins. It's interesting because these sins here, for example, hate, uh, enmity, strife, jealousy, that's listed alongside of these other more scandalous, more sort of newsworthy sins, right? For example, you ever hear of a, like on the news, you might hear of certain Christians, certain Christian pastors or Christian celebrity pastors who, who committed adultery, sexual immorality. And, the, and they're, they're not just on the uh, Christian media, but in the, in the actual news, there'll be reporting about them, right? But then you ever hear a news story about a, Christ, about a pastor with fits of anger? Or a, or a pastor uh, who committed the sin of enmity, which means hatred. You don't hear about that often, right? So these, these sins, these eight community-breaking sins are often considered respectable, as in, as in if, if you do that, it's bad, but it's not that bad. It's not as bad as sexual immorality. It's not bad, as bad as idolatry, worshiping idols. <laughs> 
And yet their presence, these community breaking sins in this list shows how serious they are. It shows that they are actually quite evil and quite destructive. And so the first of these sins is enmity, also translated hatred. And I think this is a particularly relevant sin to point out in our modern American context. Let me take this opportunity to denounce racism, which is hatred or enmity of people according to their race, right? So racism is sin, and we can point to enmity. Racism is sin. That is, if you show partiality, if you show preference to a certain race of people, to people of certain races over others, that is sin. If you discriminate against people because of their race, that is sin. That needs to be said. But racism actually covers only a small subset of this topic of enmity, of hatred. You can be completely non-racist. You can be even what today is called a anti-racist and still be guilty of enmity. Right? Because enmity here means hatred of anyone for any reason. That is sin. See, the society around us the society around us says one correct thing, which is racism is evil. But it, but it also says many incorrect things, that it's perfectly fine, it's perfectly acceptable to despise, to loathe, to scorn people who are not part of your political or ideological or religious tribe. You know what I'm talking about? Everyone is against racism, and that's great but nobody's against hatred. There's a lot of hate. And we, and we are encouraged to also stew in that hatred. Church, we must not join into the world's way of thinking, of hating our opponents, whoever they might be, because that is not a fruit of the spirit. That is a work of the flesh. Next is strife. Strife, which is also translated discord or quarreling. I think of uh, little children. I think I was, as, I was, as I was writing this in my office, I heard something going on downstairs. I think of little children bickering over whose turn it is. Or think of uh, a married couple squabbling over the smallest thing. Or imagine a church filled with conflicts about anything or, and everything. This is one of those sins that starts out seemingly small, starts out harmless, it seems, but then it contributes to the breakdown of the community. It contributes to the breakdown of relationships. And where does strife, where does discord come from? You might think, oh, it comes from an accusatory heart, someone who just wants to accuse, someone who just wants to uh, attack. But more deeply, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12, uh, the youth group has been going through Proverbs and just gives a lot of insight. Proverbs 10, 12, 12 gives us some insight. It says, hatred, hatred stirs up strife. Strife is a product of enmity, the one right before it. That is, if you... If you loathe someone, if you despise them, right, then you're going to find ways to argue with them, to squabble with them. And so you might think that you might excuse yourself and think that, oh, the reason we're arguing is because, because of a disagreement. We're thinking differently. But the second half of Proverbs, that, that proverb I just told you, Proverbs 10, 12, tells us that there is something missing. Hatred stirs up strife, but love, love covers all offenses. If you don't have love, then what's going to result is strife. Love is the antidote 
to hatred. Love is the antidote to strife. But again, if you are not led by the Spirit, if you are not walking by the Spirit, the flesh within us takes over, right? The default mode is the flesh is going to take over, and strife will be a work of the flesh that comes out of us. Jealousy is mentioned next, and this word actually is better, is, it translates a word uh, that doesn't quite mean jealousy. It translates a word that approx, it basically means an accusatory spirit, what I had mentioned earlier. This is, so a quote unquote jealous person is a person who loves to hate, someone who enjoys taking offense, someone who loves to brew in their bitterness and resentment, someone who just loves to soak in the hatred. That's what this word is talking about, jealousy. Uh, it's translated jealousy, but it means what I just said. Again, clearly, someone who's like that, this is the work of the flesh. This is not the fruit of the spirit. Next, we have fits of anger. How can you know if this is a problem you have? If people around you feel like they have to walk on eggshells around you, this might be a problem you have. If you are a powder keg that can be set off with the slightest provocation, this might be a problem you have. If you feel that it is your right to let off a little steam every now and then, you need to let your, you need to just let let loose. This might be a problem you have. If your righteous indignation results in people fleeing from you in fear, this is a problem you have, right? So fits of anger. The problem is not other people. The problem is you, if this is a work of the flesh that comes from you. And I'll take the next three together, rivalries, dissensions, and divisions. These all sound like the same thing, but again, in the Greek, there's a little bit more nuance. Uh, Paul is not using synonyms here, although they sound like synonyms. But they all do address the same issue, which is the formation of cliques, the formation of sectarian groups or political parties or rivalries and what is the what is the motivation behind such divisions they come from selfish ambition the motivation is out of not out of a desire for the good of the group but out of personal gain that's the that's the root desire behind divisions and, from, and, and once we start out having these selfish ambitions, what results is dissensions. A party spirit develops. And when I say party spirit, I don't mean like, uh, like partying, having, having fun, quote unquote, but I mean like political parties. A party spirit is wanting to divide into partisan groups. And clearly such divisiveness as political groups clearly leads to the breakdown of community. I can't help but think of politics in, in our American context. How much of politics today is driven by a commitment to advance the common good or a loyalty to political party? Now, I don't know if you follow politics, but if you do, you know what the answer is, right? in American politics, right? But that's, that's almost expected today. No one's surprised when we look out in the American political context and see that. But how much worse is it if the church displays this kind of divisiveness, this kind of factionalism? See, we can expect that out in the civil sphere, out, out, in, the, out in the world uh, in, in terms of government, because that is how humans are. That's how the flesh operates. But us who are in the church, we have the Holy Spirit, right? Does, doesn't the Holy Spirit dwell within the church? And because we have the Holy Spirit, we must not 
be like the world. We must not be divisive like the world. And this, is, this, is, this explains why Paul, the Apostle Paul, issues such a stern warning to the Corinthian church, which was, which was experiencing this kind of division. This is what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3. He says, do you not know that you, when he says you, he's referring to plural you, you all, do you not know that you all are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. Did you hear that? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. And he's talking about divisions. He's talking about this dissensions and rivalries within the church. That tells you that these community-breaking sins are not trivial. They're not respectable sins. These are actually scandalous they are not to be accepted within the church. We must look upon ourselves, not with our own human lens. We've got to examine our own selves as God sees us, right? Because these are not just community-destroying sins. These are soul-destroying sins. When God says God will destroy him, he's talking about judgment. Now, the last, the last sin that falls into this category of community-breaking sins is envy. And it almost falls within a category by itself. Because envy is it's very bad. <laughs> These are all bad. But envy, particularly, is very bad. Why? Envy is the opposite of empathy. You guys know what empathy is? Empathy is if someone is rejoicing, you rejoice with them. If someone is mourning, you mourn with them. You come alongside them. Envy is the opposite of that. That means if someone else is rejoicing, you're sad. If someone else is, is upset, you're happy. You see how evil and twisted that is? That is envy. It is, it's, to get, uh, it's to get upset that that person over there is doing well. Hey, that person is succeeding you go on Facebook and you see someone doing well in life, that hurts you. That's envy, right? The, we're called to rejoice when others are rejoicing, not mourn when others are rejoicing. But envy is joyful when, our, when this other person mourns. We're joyful when they're sad, and then when they're happy, we're sad. This is particularly heinous, because it's more than just greed. You know, for example, greed or covetousness, you just want what they have, right? Whether or not they're sad or happy, that doesn't really matter. You just want what they have. And so maybe because of greed, you become a thief. But envy, envy is deeper. You want them to suffer. Envy is particularly heinous. May it not be named among the people of God. The final two works of the flesh have to do with the degenerate lifestyle that was common among the Gentiles in, during that day. Translated here, drunkenness and orgies. Now, we all know what drunkenness is. It's drinking for the purpose of intoxication. It's, and that includes more than just alcohol. It includes taking any type of substance. And there are many substances out there these days for the purpose of getting high. Of, 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 you, the point is achieving some sort of altered state of mind, right? Modern science highlights the disease aspect of drug addictions. And certainly we don't want to deny that there is a disease aspect to physical dependency, which drives many drug and alcohol addictions. But we have to also understand that there is a voluntary aspect to it, even though there is a unwanted disease aspect to addictions, there is also a voluntary aspect that we must not minimize. It's both. It's voluntary as well as disease. In church, drunkenness is a work of the flesh. 
And finally here, the, translation, the word that's translated orgies is probably a bit too specifically sexual, uh, although it does include that connotation. The Greek word doesn't mean exactly orgies. It, it means something more like wild parties, right? So if you, if you, uh, if this is one of the works of the flesh or the word that's translated orgies, it just means that you are a, you're a party animal. The kind of stuff that's celebrated, the, the kind of stuff that's glorified in teen movies. You guys know, you guys know teenage movies? Uh, I don't want to name any, but you know, there's, there's many teen movies out there uh, the ones that are rated R, and they're, you know, they glorify this sort of like party culture. And that word is talking about that. So again, brothers and sisters, what was the point of going through this whole list of sins? Was it to, to depress, depress us? We are not naturally inclined to closely examine our own lives. That's not how we, most people tend to operate. Again, right, just like just like the, the Pharisee in, the, in the Jesus' parable, we're inclined to justify ourselves and to see only the good. Or we're like another person in one of Jesus' parable, parables. We're inclined to examine the speck in our brother's eye. You guys know the parable of the speck and the, and the log? Our, our brother has a speck in his eye. A little, a little piece of dust. And, and we're very concerned about the speck in his eye, but we're not too concerned to remove the log. You guys know what a log is? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big tree. The log that is sticking out of our own eye. Our tendency is not to look within. Our, we're, we're very quick to look out in others and, and judge others. Aha, you're doing that and that. But our tendency is not to think about the log that's sticking out of our own eye. Church, let us allow the word of God to shine a bright light upon our own conduct. Even down to the motives of our hearts, the desires of the flesh within us. Why? So that we can confess, so that we can repent, so that we can be forgiven, so that we can be purified. Let us root out these sins by the power of the Spirit within us. Let us not gratify the desires of the flesh within us because the stakes are high. How high are the stakes? Let's read along here in verse 22. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is an important warning that does not negate the gospel. This is part of the gospel. Right? The gospel says that you cannot earn your way into the kingdom of God. You cannot be righteous enough to inherit the kingdom of God. What have we been learning in Galatians? Salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. But that does not mean that sin is now unimportant. That does not mean that repentance is now unimportant. We, we just put that aside. No, just as we were reminded last week, now that you are united to Christ, now that you have been given the Spirit, what now? You must walk by the Spirit. Because that's who you are. The old you has been crucified with Christ. Right? It no longer lives, but Christ now lives in you. See, if you are justified, that is, you have been made acceptable before God, now, justification must lead to sanctification, meaning you must now become more like Christ. Right? Justification goes hand in hand with sanctification. So the warning that Paul gives here does not mean that you've, you must be sinless. You've got to be perfect in order to inherit the kingdom of God. That's not what it means. It means you got to have faith in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Because if you have faith, then God gives you his Holy Spirit. And if you have the Spirit within you, you what? You walk by the, you walk by the Spirit. 
If you have the Spirit within you, you, what? You are led by the Spirit. And so if you are led by the Spirit, your life will not be continually characterized by these works of the flesh. If your life is continually characterized by, by these type of sins, that demonstrates that perhaps the Spirit of God is not within you. It demonstrates that perhaps your faith is not genuine. And that's why you still continue to walk in this way. So brothers and sisters, let us weigh, let us consider ourselves carefully whether or not we are in the faith. Let us examine ourselves with clear eyes. And then after we, look upon, when we examine ourselves, let us turn our eyes upon our Savior who had mercy upon us. Our Savior pulled us out of the dirt. He pulled us out of death, out of our sin and out of our misery and brought us to himself. In closing, let me read from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul writes, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. He, Paul is saying, you used to be that. You used to be the, those type of people. Such were some of you. But, but you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Indeed, Lord, as we are confronted by the mirror of the law, of, of this list of works of the flesh, Lord God, we are inclined to shield ourselves, to, to not repent. Lord, but I pray for your spirit that you would root out these sins within us. Lord, so that we can become more like Christ. And we thank you that you have given us your spirit who gives us the power, Lord, to no longer walk by the flesh, but walk by the spirit in obedience to you. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you washed us, you sanctified us, you justified us. And Lord, that we are now freed, freed forevermore. We praise you and we glorify you. In your name we pray. Amen.